picture a scene. You're 18, and you've spent the last two years of your life studying hard for your A-levels to get into university. It is Thursday, 13th of August, 2020. You walk up to your school. You walk into your school hall. You go to a table and pick up your exam results in an envelope. When you open up the envelope, you find that you are two grades below what you were expecting. Two grades below what your universities have offered you. Two grades below what your job was expecting you to have. When you walked up to your school that morning, you were expecting to be able to go off and do the things you wanted to do, and now you've got to spend the rest of your day, the rest of your week, planning out the rest of your life again. Now, this is an experience which happens to plenty of people, unfortunately, every year. But something was different in 2020. Because in 2020, the students themselves couldn't really say why that had happened. The teachers couldn't really say why that had happened. No one really knew. What actually happened was this thing. This is the off-call algorithm for determining A-level grades in 2020 for class sizes or cohorts, I should say, larger than 15. And without going into all of the detail of what this is, you can go and look at my lovely, lovely scribbles there if you can decipher my handwriting, which, good luck. Um, but without going into all of the detail, this is basically looking at the last three years of your school's history. Depending on how pupils at your school have performed before, you'd be judged on, on a distribution entirely based off of that, essentially. This didn't consider you as an individual, it considered you as a data point. It didn't consider your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, the work you put in. It considered where you came from. That's pretty silly. I thought that was pretty silly, at least. So I teamed up with a wonderful, wonderful non-profit called Foxglove and the law firm Lee Day to launch a legal challenge against the government on this. We challenged the government on a number of different grounds. We thought that it was ultra vires, outside of the scope of what Ofqual could do. We thought that it was irrational, because clearly it doesn't make sense to judge individual students based on the history of their school. That's a pretty pathetic way of doing things. We thought that it was a breach of the GDPR, because under the GDPR, processing has to be fair, and you have a right not to be subject to a decision that's based on automated processing that produces legal or similarly significant effects. I think it's pretty difficult to argue that potentially setting the course for the rest of your life is not a legal or similarly significant effect. We thought that it was unlawful discrimination because they had mock exam appeals routes which just wouldn't work for disabled students, and many of them, and the algorithm itself is essentially based on a postcode lottery, which has real implications for indirect discrimination. Worth noting, not all of these grounds apply outside of the public sector. Some of these things are specific to what goes on in government, but the challenges posed, they all remain the same. The fundamental problems that we have here remain the same whether you're working in the public sector, the private sector, or the third sector. The thing is, people at Ofqual knew that this was a problem. This was a 16th of August, Sunday, three days after results day, and they were briefing anonymously in the Telegraph that they wanted the government to U-turn. And it's really good they realised that, right? Having knowledge of that is a really good thing. The challenge is, three days after results day is too late. As it happens, the U-turn did come. The government U-turned on the Monday, tw about 12 hours before we were due to the launch in the High Court. But it was too late. Because up and down the country, students' lives had already been changed, universities had been changed, job offers had been changed. So the challenge becomes then, what more could we have done? I'm not going to go here into a deep dive into all the problems that led up to this specific issue. There were plenty of them, ranging from the Royal Statistical Society offering help and being forced out by not wanting to sign an NDA, to essentially no consultation from anyone. But it's really complex here because this bridges public policy with technical implementation. Where do we draw the line here between what's the role of a politician to decide from a public policy standpoint and what's the role of us as statisticians, as computer scientists, as software engineers, whatever role we have in this kind of application? Because we have to build it. Politicians might make the policy, but at the end of the day, we are the ones implementing it. Decision-makers in companies might make decisions about what a product should do. 
But at the end of the day, we are the ones implementing it. And for a moment here, let's talk about bridges. I can build a bridge in my garden if I had a lovely stream in my garden, which I don't because I'm renting a student house in Southampton. But if I wasn't, I could build a bridge in my garden. But I can't really build a bridge for a council. Or at least if I did, the council would have some pretty interesting questions to answer about why on earth they picked me to do that. I am not qualified to build bridges. I know nothing about engineering at all. It wouldn't make any sense for a local authority to contract me. As technologists, in whatever area of technology here, and quick side note that I'm using technologists as a very broad term deliberately, because whether you're in user research, whether you're in software engineering, whether you're in some completely different area of technology that I know nothing about, this all matters to you. We all build stuff every day that affects millions more than any one bridge. And yet, we don't always suffer consequences when things go wrong as individuals in the same way that a bridge engineer might, because we aren't seen as a profession in the same way. There's advantages to that and there's disadvantages to that, but it is the truth nonetheless. We don't get seen like a lot of other high-risk professions. You've probably seen this XKCD before about uh, electronic voting. And it's kind of right, right? Like, there are significant problems with a lot of the things that we do. But there's a perception outside of tech that we're a lot better at some of this than we are. And I think that's true of a lot of industries, right? If you don't know the ins and outs, if you don't know the nuts and bolts, it's pretty easy to think, oh, everybody must be sorting all of these problems. But this isn't by magic that this situation has come about. There is an implicit social contract between us as technologists and the people that we serve. And the people that we serve aren't necessarily our customers. The people that we serve are our customers' customers, are our end users, the people who are interacting with the thing that we're building, the people whose lives the thing we're building is affecting. We see this across the board. Cambridge Analytica, the scandal in 2018, it was a scandal because people have expectations about that social contract. It didn't actually matter if Facebook's privacy policy said, if you attach these apps in this way, you might be able to see this data. Or if your friends attach their apps in this way, they might be able to see this data. Because there was an implicit expectation from people that didn't match up to the reality of what was going on. And that's a real challenge. How do we solve that? How do we solve an expectation which we haven't necessarily put in place, but we've created through the context in which we live? The violations of this social contract get even worse with generative AI. We look at things like this, the snake fight feces defense. This is frankly hilarious. If you haven't seen the original stuff about this, uh, ecosphere it, I guess, so you don't get AI'd. Um, but this is kind of funny, right? We can look at this and go, haha, a generative AI system has found something that's clearly nonsensical and put up some answers about it. We can say this is funny and we sit around and say how silly this is because in practice, this isn't really going to affect anyone. No one is genuinely Googling whether they can do snakes at their thesis defence 10 minutes before their thesis defence. Or if they are, I'm really sorry, clearly things have gone very wrong. <laughs> and yet at the same time, we also have things like this. And on the face of it, we can laugh at these things too, right? Because attaching glue to pizza in order to stick cheese on it, or eating a rock a day because doctors recommend it, clearly, obviously, we can laugh at this, because obviously, no adult would ever do... <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> admittedly, clearly, I'm not genuinely suggesting that this Business Insider journalist uh, was seriously doing this on the uh, suggestion that it was a good idea. And yet, Business Insider journalists, adults, are not the only people who use Google. We teach our children to trust Google. Even if we're not explicitly sitting there telling them to, even if we're explicitly sitting there actually going, you should be cautious about the stuff we see online. When we have questions about the world, as normal adults in society, we Google it. And we're probably not always as careful as we might suggest to kids that they should be. We've innovated at a pace faster than our social contract can keep up. And that puts us in a really difficult situation. In the rest of the world, we have analogues for this. This thing, here, this is a speed bump. It is a deliberately obstructive impediment to progress. We choose, as society, to physically restrict people from going too fast. 
We choose ladder society because we recognise that going too fast down the road doesn't just impact the person in the car, but it also impacts the people in the car coming towards you. It also impacts the child on the side of the road. It also impacts the people crossing the road at the end of the road. We didn't do that with Facebook. And it kind of makes sense we didn't, right? Because when Facebook was starting out, it wasn't sitting there with the intention of becoming some multinational media empire as it essentially is today. It was sitting there with the intention of being, hey, I know, let's build something that connects a few hundred high school students or a few hundred college students in the US. We tack on trust and safety, trust and safety, and things like that afterwards. They are an afterthought in our design. That creates the problems that we have in technology today. That creates the problems of trust. That creates the problems of a mismatched social contract because we don't think about these things. Because at the end of the day, today, we are the modern equivalent of wizards. We have power right now that no one could envisage 50 years ago. We can change the world from this field in ways that 50 years ago would have required companies or even governments significant amounts of resource, significant amounts of planning, significant amounts of finances. And this is a really good thing in many ways. Technology levels the playing field in so, so many different ways. And yet, at the same time, it makes us really dangerous. We aren't all ethically trained. In fact, most of us aren't ethically trained. I completed a computer science degree at the end of last year, and it didn't really give me any ethical foundation at all. In fact, I was giving a talk not that long ago to first-year computer science students, trying to give them a little bit of ethics education, because they don't really get any in the content of their degree. The other day, I overheard someone on the train talking about how their dev team at work are too idealistic, describing them as not emotionally intelligent and getting in the way of what the company wants. And just as a brief aside here, if you're ever describing someone as not emotionally intelligent, there's probably about a 60% chance that you're actually just misunderstanding neurodiversity. But putting that to one side, good. Sometimes our role as technologists, as technology professionals, should be to get in the way of what the company wants. At least I think so. If you work in software or work anywhere adjacent to software, you've almost certainly seen this, the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. And one of the principles in the Agile Manifesto is that our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now, people have all sorts of thoughts about Agile. I am sure there's plenty of people in this room who will talk to you at length about whether or not they think Agile is a suitable method for designing software or developing software. I am not qualified to have that conversation in the slightest. I will leave that argument to any of you who have opinions on that. You are more than welcome to have your opinions on it. And yet this specific principle, this one here, this I do take umbrage with. Because this principle, the idea that our highest priority is always to satisfy the customer, makes us mercenaries for building other people's stuff. This takes away our professional identity as individuals. It takes away our agency. And it drives conflict because it creates collisions between our personal and our professional identity. We describe ourselves as makers, and I think that's a really nice term. But it does put priority on making above everything else. And as technology professionals, as technologists, we shouldn't just be thinking about how do we build the next thing. We should be thinking about should we build this and how do we build this in a way which protects people's rights. On my undergraduate degree, I did some research on e-consultation systems. Um, if you've ever done an Ask Your GP or an e-consult or any of those kinds of things with your GP, um, this sort of thing is what we're talking about here. And they're actually really good systems, right? These things save people's lives because you can talk to a GP much more easily for an e-consultation and sometimes you'll be an awful lot more honest for an e-consultation than you would be through an in-person consultation. Because going and finding a GP appointment is hard and talking to someone in person is awkward. Um, I'm pretty sure that's something which everybody in this room can probably agree on. At the same time, if you ask people if they really understand what's going on in these systems, <laughs> the answer is almost always no. And I don't mean understand from a technical perspective here, I mean understand where is your data going? Who has access to it? How long are they storing it? Where's my medical data going? Seriously, that's quite an important question, right? That's some of the most important data that we have on ourselves about our health. 
I did a study here comparing the existing interfaces of a bunch of existing systems with some new ones I designed based on what kind of industry standards and technology are for collecting consent. And what I found was a really good correlation between the quality of the consent that we gained and the perception of the user interface. A better user interface produced better quality consent using a metric I designed called QuickDig. And that's a, you know, it's a really good finding, right? It's nice, it proves that there's something which is useful to be done there with user research, and yet, if any of you have any background in user research, you might be familiar with the SUS score, the System Usability Score. Um, these are the results from the study. Uh, what we found was that the maximum SUS score here was 36. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with how the SUS score operates, um, and yes, haha, SUS score, Amogus, etc. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, a 36 is a letter grade of F. It is around the fifth percentile of usability. To quote John Oliver, when it comes to something this important, I think we should really be insisting on something more in the C minus kind of range. Right? <laughs> this stuff matters. There's many reasons for this, right? It is difficult to build a user interface for regulatory compliance because no one is interested in regulatory compliance. If you talk to people, most of the time they aren't going to want to spend a load of time finding out all of the detail about how something operates. But in part, this is also what happens when there's no direct financial incentive and no professional incentive. In healthcare, we have regulators. We have HCPC who regulate paramedics, orthoptists, hearing aid dispensers and a bunch of other healthcare professionals. We have the General Medical Council who regulate doctors and will soon be regulating physician associates and anesthesia associates. And we have the Nursing and Midwifery Council who regulate nurses, midwives and nursing associates. And these people's role is to exist to manage a list of people who can do a profession, usually based on a set of qualifications. They'll kind of update their list in a revalidation window. These people essentially put an impetus on the people who are working in those fields to care about those ethics, because they've got a code of practice. People can argue a lot about whether this is a good model for software or not. And people have argued a lot about whether this is a good model for software or not. And I'm going to throw my hat in the ring and say I don't think it is. Which is maybe not where you're expecting me to go here, but most of these arguments put a focus on professional qualification requirements, or examinations. I have a degree now, like I say. I don't think my degree really made that much difference to my ability to write quality software, to be honest. And I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room who don't have degrees and are substantially more qualified software engineers than I am. I have absolutely no intention to say that I am the best software engineer in the world. I am very much not. The point here, though, isn't necessarily about those examinations, isn't necessarily about those qualification requirements. The point is responsibility, and that's the but here. That's the important bit which these regulators add on top of just the regulation that they offer. The principle that we are responsible as professionals for the things that we do. We aren't responsible for our system failures. We aren't responsible for the context in which we live. But we are responsible for the way in which we react to the context in which we live. I'd like to consider, well, to consider, to invite you all to consider yourselves to be practitioners of technology. We practice this field. And if we're practitioners of technology, we ought to act like it. That means having responsibility, and it means balancing risks. If you were at EMF in 2022, you might have seen Ryan's excellent talk on some gender care stuff. Um, and I saw this toot from them and thought, Yes, <laughs> right? This matters. We do an awful lot of QA stuff and we do an awful lot of design stuff based around what we expect our users to do and what we expect our users to not do. We do QA for what happens when the bar burns down and someone orders minus a thousand drinks. But we don't really do that testing for ethics. We don't always necessarily think, right, if I was someone who was trying to be evil with the software I'm about to build, what would I do? Not how can I break the system. Not how can I find a bug. How can I find a way to make the system work as intended to serve an illegitimate purpose, to cause harm? And yet, at the same time, the solution here clearly isn't just stop building software, right? We can't just stop building technology because that introduces its own risks. Technology is amazing and it does really good things. This is a paper from 2020 where we identified that when wet age relative macular degeneration is spotted in one eye, ML can detect it in the other one 
much faster than a human clinician can. There's a risk here of us not intervening in just the same way that there's a risk in healthcare of not intervening. And our job as practitioners is to balance those risks. I think there's some principles here which we can talk about. I think that we should be protecting and promoting human life, health, welfare and individual rights above client concerns. I think we should be challenging behaviours, plans and actions which don't fall in line with that. We have a responsibility as practitioners to balance risks, to reduce the risk of harm to individuals and to society, and to accept our personal responsibility alongside corporate responsibility, not in place of, but alongside that responsibility. As gatekeepers to technology, we have a role to prevent the risk of accidental discrimination. We have a role to think about reinforcing existing societal biases and to practice in a way that not just doesn't violate people's rights directly, but actively promotes equality, actively builds a better society. We should be accepting the limits of our practice, keeping our skills up to date, and understanding that we don't know everything. We can't walk into someone else's job role, whether in technology or in another field, and rewrite it as a piece of code without talking to them first. And most importantly, we should be encouraging feedback from others when people think that we're violating these things, when people think we're not acting in line with our principles. These things are inspired by the HCPC standards of conduct, performance and ethics. And you might quite reasonably say, so what? Right? There's another white person standing up on a stage going through a list of principles. We've done this before. This isn't new. I think the key difference here is how we frame these things. And I put those principles there not really as guidance in and of themselves, although I think there are genuinely good things about them which don't necessarily exist in other lists of principles, but as an identity. The ACM has ethics guidelines. Chartered engineers have ethics guidelines. They have. I am a practitioner. This becomes a question of identity, and we have suggestions from research, right, that codes of ethics might not always make a huge deal of difference to people in their decision making. Even where, maybe, people point out explicitly, do you think these decisions are in line with the ACM's code of ethics, might not make a huge deal of difference to the way you make your decisions. But we also know from research that having a central moral identity as professionals can make a difference. Putting our morals, putting our ethics at the centre of who we are, considering it to be a part of ourselves, that really is powerful. So how do we make that work in practice? Well, I think one of the most important things here actually is reflective practice. Outside of my technical role, I am an emergency ambulance crew at Central Ambulance. As part of that role, I have to submit a portfolio every year. And part of that is submitting reflective practice documents. I have to think about where things have happened, what's happened, how has it happened, why has it happened, and what can I do to improve my practice. This doesn't necessarily just apply to when things have gone wrong. It applies to anything. Thinking about how we can make our practice as technologists better. There's two models I like to use for this. One is what, so what, now what? And the other one is called I fear. But they're fundamentally the same sorts of things. I'd like to invite you to consider yourself a practitioner technologist and to consider reflecting on your practice regularly, especially when things go wrong, especially when you identify that maybe something has happened that doesn't fall in line with your ethics, that doesn't fall in line with how you want to see the world, when you've had a hand in something that actually you go home afterwards and think, is this really what I want to be doing? Have I made the world better today? Reflect on it. And think about that now what piece. What can I do to change my practice in the future? Maybe it's about challenging those behaviours more. Maybe it's about being able to stand up. And if you're a manager in this audience, if you're someone at a higher level in technology, identifying in this way, identifying yourself publicly as being a practitioner technologist, committing yourself publicly in a way that the people who are looking up to you are going to be looking at, makes a real difference. We know, again, from research, that when people are higher up in organisations identifying themselves in this kind of way, we're able to make people lower down the organisation chain feel much more conf confident and comfortable in speaking up. So, the key point here is our identity. 
understanding our profession as centrally framed in our ethics. We are uniquely placed to deal with this. Politicians can't because they don't have the technical expertise. We are uniquely placed to deal with this because business leaders don't have the technical expertise. It is part of our job as good practitioner technologists to understand the context in which we sit, to think about how we're making things work and to think about whether we're making things work, not just for the companies we work in, not just for the context in which we sit, but for society at large. Because if we don't, no one else will. We are wizards. We have magic powers and let's use them to make the world better, not worse. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the MF. That's got the principles on and also a badge stick on your website.